I want you to take again and turn with me, please, to Colossians 1. Colossians chapter 1. If you ever want to do a special, my wife would uh, let you audition. And uh, we'll go from there. So you have a special you want to do. Colossians 1. If you've ever traveled to another country, some of you come from another country. But if you've ever traveled to another country and you happen to attend a Bible-believing church where you've never been before, you've experienced an instant bond when you walk into that congregation. Because there's a fellowship that believers in Jesus share that is absolutely amazing. One of the facts that you need to remember about the book of Colossians is that while Paul wrote this letter from a Roman prison to the Colossian church, he never, as far as we know, stepped foot in the city of Colossae. He had never been there. And yet, though he never met them, he expresses a deep love for them and a deep appreciation for them. And uh, I think that it's because there is that strong bond among believers. He talks about the love that he has for them and the love that they have for others. And that's what uh, this is about. But uh, I think chapter one, well, the whole book, but chapter one in particular really introduces us to what I would call a deeper spiritual life, a deeper life, deeper in the sense that believers can experience a closer walk with the Lord or relationship with the Lord than perhaps you and I have imagined. Deeper life through the Lord Jesus that brings his loving, holy, victorious life over sin into your life. It's a deeper life in that sense. And that's what I want to share with you, but it, it really revolves around several things. The first thing is who you are as a believer in Christ. But that's only important if we know who Jesus is, who he is. And then I want to also uh, answer the question, who you are with Christ in you. There's a difference between who you are in Christ versus who you are with Christ in you. And I want to make that distinction as we look at this first chapter in Colossians this morning. Let's pause a moment and pray. Father, it certainly is good for us to be here. Peter was right on that mountain. But Lord, we want your will to be done. And we want you to be the focal point and no one else. And so I pray that you will make this time a very, very special time as we have opened the word of God together. And as you have something specifically to speak to our hearts about here. So, Lord, do your work as only you can. And I pray that our hearts would be just open books that you could write your word and your will upon, and we would, uh, we would say yes to it. <clears throat> Spirit of God, you are that ink that uh, is written in the fleshly tables of our heart. And so we pray for your working and uh, for your ministry, both uh, through the lips and through the ears, as you would move in our service here and our time together. We thank you again that we have a Bible, the very word of God that uh, you speak to our hearts out of. And like was already shared this morning, if we're your sheep, we hear your voice. And Lord, we know you and you know us. And so I do pray that 
that kind of work would be accomplished here today in Jesus name. Amen. So I want to take the first uh, 13 verses and just share with you who you are in Christ. <laughs> you know, that's amazing. When you think that the moment you get saved, you are joined permanently to the Lord Jesus Christ. The spirit of Christ and your spirit are joined permanently together. And you become one in Christ. You become a part of what is called the body of Christ. A moment of salvation simultaneous with you depending on Jesus as your Savior from sin. You are put into Christ. And there are two kinds of truth that I want to uh, share with you regarding who you are in Christ. The first kind of truth is what I call positional truth. And by that, I mean, this is what God says about you. It's true of you. It's your real identity, whether you feel it or even know it. It's true of you. It's the position, it's the standing that every single born-again believer has. This is who you are in Christ. And I want you to see it as we pick up in verse 2. Notice who he is writing to. And this is you, if you're a believer. He says, to the saints. To the saints. The word saint is also translated often in our New Testament, holy. So a saint is a holy person. There's a lot of confusion, I think, in our circles, about what holiness is. You know what it means to be holy? It means to be in the presence of God. Holiness is God's presence. Let me give you this example, an illustration that I think will help. The land of Canaan was inhabited by wicked pagan people that were just complete immoral people. And yet when God moved his people and himself moved into that land, it became known as the Holy Land. Why? Because God's presence inhabited that place. Jerusalem, before it was Israel's, it was occupied by pagan Jebusite people. And uh, But when God chose Jerusalem to be the place where he would abide, it became known as the holy city. <laughs> there are holy things, there are holy seasons in the, in the scripture that are only that because of God's presence that makes them holy. It's the presence of God that really defines holiness. And when God calls people like you and I holy or saints, it's because the presence of God is in us. And the presence of God is with us. We are in God's Holy One, the Lord Jesus. That's who you are in Christ. That's your true identity. No matter whether you feel it, believe it or not, that's your true identity. If you are a believer, you are a saint. Holy, set apart the presence of God. Notice also in the second verse, as he greets them, he says, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father. That also speaks of positional truth. Not only saint, but we are the recipients of grace and truth. In fact, grace uh, uh, and peace, rather, are the basis for our standing in the Lord. The only reason we ever could be called saints, the only reason that uh, we could ever be in God's presence is because we are the recipients of his grace. And grace basically is it's God's favor. It's God's smile upon our life that we could never deserve. We could never merit it. It's God's favor toward us, grace. 
That's the basis for our position, our standing. And when you have God's grace, when you're a recipient of that, you know what also you get with that? Peace. That is, God's no longer, you're no longer the object of God's wrath. The Bible says, and this is something that really needs to sink in, that every lost person, the wrath of God currently abides on them. And it becomes really manifest at the end when they stand before the great white throne and are forever separated from him in that uh, burning lake of fire. But the fact of the matter is, every human being, apart from being in Christ, are not at peace with God. God's wrath is against them. You might say God's at war with them and they're at war with him. But when you become a believer, you are put into Christ. And as a result, you become a saint. You are in the presence of God. And you become a recipient of his unearned favor, his unmerited favor, his grace. And that puts you in a position of peace with God and no longer the object of his wrath. That ought to make people want to run to Christ. <laughs> if you believe that, and that's what the Bible teaches, you ought to run into the arms of Jesus because this is what he is. He's grace and peace. And that's the basis of our positional truth here. But look at what it also gives us. It, it says uh, <clears throat> in these verses, verse 5, uh, for the hope that is laid up for us in heaven. We have hope as well. Uh, hope is something that is looked forward to. We have hope because we have a heavenly focus. You know, we are warned and we are encouraged and admonished uh, in different ways in the scripture that our focus ought not to be on this earthly life, but ought to be on heaven and things above and um, eternal life. That, that's what really ought to be our focus because that's the object of our hope. He talks about an inheritance that we have in verse 12. We give thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be the partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And that inheritance is a heavenly inheritance. Peter tells us it's, a, it's an inheritance that God has personally reserved for every single believer. It is an inheritance that cannot be corrupted. It's an inheritance that can never be stolen. It's, it's there, reserved for us. It's a, it's a heavenly and an eternal inheritance. And that is the positional truth that we have. And it, it motivates this positional truth, this standing that we have in God as saints, as the recipients of his grace and his peace. With this hope in our heart, it, is, it's, it's, it motivates expectation in our lives. But the positional truth doesn't end there. Uh, he, he talks about the deliverance that God's people are the recipients of. Look at uh, down with me in verses 13 and 14. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Now notice he says in verse 12, we are saints in light. We've been delivered, verse 13, from the power of darkness and been translated into the kingdom of his dear son, into the kingdom of light or in the kingdom of his dear son, if you will. And so here's more of the positional truth of who we are in Christ. Verse 13, he, he, uh, he gives us deliverance. And that deliverance involves, verse 14, redemption through his blood, and the forgiveness of sins. We've been rescued from Satan's kingdom, and we have been bought by the blood of Jesus, which gives us forgiveness of all sin and freedom in Christ by his own blood. And we have been reconciled. Look at verse 21 and 22. You that were sometime alienated at enemies in your mind by wicked works, Yet now hath he reconciled. See that? Verse 20, 
uh, to in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. What a total change of relationship. The word reconcile speaks of the total change that takes place in our lives. as We have been reconciled to God. We have been taken from one position to another position, from one kingdom to another kingdom, from the dark kingdom to the dear kingdom, he says here in these verses. And we've been brought as a result into a very uh, closeness to the Lord. We've been brought into closeness, not just Jewish people, but he makes it very clear here, you that were afar off, Gentiles as well. Jew or Gentile, we've been reconciled through Jesus. Now, I have my notes here, and uh, let's say that I, I put this piece of paper into the Bible here, and I take this Bible, and I put it in a box, and I wrap, I wrap the box, and I put a mailing label on it, and I, I send this Bible to Denver, Colorado, okay? Well, guess what? Wherever this Bible goes, the paper that I placed in it goes. Whatever happened to Jesus and whatever Jesus is happened to you and you share in that. Because as this piece of paper is slipped into my Bible, and thus everything, every place this Bible goes, the paper goes, if you are a believer, you have been put into Christ. You are in Christ. And so everything that is true of him is true of you. Let that sink in. Try to wrap your mind around that. Because let's be honest, we know. We know how unfaithful we are. We know often how ungodly our, our, even our thoughts are, let alone our, our actions. And yet, in Christ, we're saints. In Christ, recipients of grace, peace, hope, and inheritance, total deliverance, forgiveness of sin, redemption, we're free. We're reconciled to God. All of that is who you are positionally in Christ. Got that? Now let's talk about the practical aspects of being in Christ. That's who we are positionally. But what a, how does that look in our practical daily life? What does that look like? Well, that's the second part of what I want to share with who you are in Christ. And it uh, we go back to verse 2. He says, to the saints and the faithful brethren. He calls them faithful. And I think he calls them faithful because that's what they are. He sees these people as, as being full of faith. We think of faithful as being dependable, and yeah, that's, that's a definition of it. But faithful is full of faith. And we know that faith is simply trust in the Lord. He sees them as people that are full of trust in the Lord. He sees them as thankful people, and uh, he gives thanks for them. In verse 3, he says, here, here, here is the practical aspect. Here is, pra uh, uh, in a practical way, how this positional truth is lived out in our life. We're thankful people. Paul expresses thanks to God here, and uh, we're a people also that uh, not only thank God, but... Uh, they are full of dependence upon him. Look at verse 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ and the love which you have to all saints, this is how our positional being in Christ gets worked out in a practical way. By that dependence upon God that is lived out in love for one another, in love for God's people. That's why I said at the beginning, you can go anywhere in the world, and if you walk into a Bible-believing congregation, 
you'll find a bond of fellowship there, even though you don't know these people, because of this faith and this love that is the practical outworking of who we are in Christ. Of course, fruitful as well. He, he uh, thanks God in verse 6 uh, for how they are bringing forth fruit. You know, some people only care about being faithful, showing up, doing what they're supposed to. You know, that's, that's expected. That's good. But our service for the Lord is not merely to be faithful. It's to be fruitful. We want it to be effective. We want what we do in faithfulness to God to bear fruit. And he's commended. This is a practical way in which that position of truth is lived out in a fruitful life and a prayerful life. What a wonderful prayer that Paul prays for these people. Believers are praying people. Look at how Paul prays for them. Pick up in verse 9. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Believers don't cease to pray. Believers are praying people. They pray all the time, and they pray about everything. He says, we haven't ceased to pray for you and desire. Notice his requests. Hey, these are some great requests for people that you love and people that you know. These are great prayer requests. Listen to them. That you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Verse 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. You might please God by your lifestyle. That you might have an increased understanding of God in his word. Verse 9, verse 10, that you would be fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, growing in the Lord. Verse 11, strengthened with all might, that is, in your inner person. Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power. And that strength giving you patience, uh, endurance, and uh, long-suffering, and joyfulness. What a wonderful prayer request for people. These are good things that they would have continued insight, verse 9, in their heart and their mind, and know the will insight about the will of God, that their, their spiritual life would be fruitful, that they would uh, uh, their spiritual life would deepen because it's growing in an intimacy with God, and that God would uh, strengthen them inwardly so that they'd be able to power through all the circumstances of daily life. That's practical righteousness, it might be called. Positional righteousness is what we've just looked at prior to. This is practical righteousness. You know, it's interesting to me that at the end, when we sit down at the great feast, you know there's going to be a wedding feast, there's going to be a marriage feast one day for God's people. Right now, we're the bride of Christ. That's what we're considered to be. But one day, we're going to be the wife. One day, the marriage is going to be consummated. And in Revelation chapter 19, there is a wedding feast, and the, the, the bride of Christ is sitting there in, it says, uh, fine linen, white and clean. I think it's Revelation 19.8. And what that means is that we believers will be identified by the practical righteousness that is that has been evident in our earthly lives as we sit down there at that marriage feast. It's not the righteousness that is imputed to us, that's positional, but it's righteousness that is imparted to us as we depend, as we trust the Lord in our daily walk with him. It's the white, clean linen of the saints. That's the practical uh, truth of what it means to be in Christ. Well, who is Christ? You say, well, pretty obvious. We know who he is. But have you seen him as he is described in verses 15 to 20, for example? This is 
a very definitive New Testament passage on the deity of Christ, on him being the divine son of God. Notice it. Who, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is a visible representation of the invisible God. Remember in his ministry with his disciples? Remember what uh, Philip said? Lord, show us the Father, and that will be sufficient. That'll be enough. And Jesus rebuked Philip gently, but he rebuked him. He said, Philip, have I been with you all this time? And you say, show us the Father? You've seen me. You've seen the Father. Because he is the image, the exact representation. It is a mirror image of the Father. Jesus is the mirror image of the invisible God. Why? Because he is God. Even though the Father and the Son are two different persons of the Godhead, he mirrors the Father. He is the firstborn. That is, he precedes every other creature all creation. Why? Because verse 16 says, all creation was created by him. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are in earth. That's things that we can see. But also, notice this, not only the visible, but the invisible. You know, there's an invisible, unseen realm. God created it. There are numerous, can't count them, myriads of unseen spirit beings that God has created. And he even mentions that in that 16th verse, thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. All of these, uh, we could, we could uh, go to the book of Ephesians and uh, just note what he says there in the first chapter. Listen to this. I'll read it so you don't have to turn there. Um, <clears throat> he says that when Jesus rose from the dead, the Father set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion. What is he talking about there when he uses that terminology? These are actually these words in rabbinic thought uh, of Paul's day describe different orders of invisible spirit beings. Okay, so Jesus is the creator not only of the visible, but the invisible realm as well. And there is an invisible realm that uh, we need to be aware of. But go on. In verse 17, and he is before all things. That is, he precedes all things in time. And by him, all things consist. By that, it means this whole created universe was made by Jesus and is sustained by him. He maintains it. He holds it all together. If he doesn't, it flies apart. <laughs> it no longer exists. Verse 18, and he, Jesus, is the head of the body. What's the body? Well, it's a spiritual body. It's called the church. And it's not just this church, but it's it's the whole church of the Lord Jesus Christ that not only exists now, but existed for the last 2,000 years. And we don't know how much longer after we're done. It's the entire church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the head of it. We're the body. We're part of the body. He, Jesus, is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. He precedes all who will ever be resurrected. Why? That in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him, in Jesus, all the fullness, that is, all the fullness of God would dwell in Jesus in a human body. And so... Who is he? Well, he's obviously the sovereign. You see that in those verses. Messiah is not just a man. He's God. And he's eternal. And he is supreme over all his creation. He is the sustainer as well as the creator of everything seen and unseen. And by the way, 
This is the first reference in the book of Colossians to the unseen realm. It is hinted at in the uh, verses that precede that, where we are told that we have been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. That gives us an implication that there is a dark kingdom. Uh, there is a, an unseen realm that is a dark kingdom. But this is the first direct reference to it in these verses that we've read. He is death's conqueror. He's the firstborn from the dead. He's conquered death. He is God's fullness in a human body. Remember I said last week when we introduced the book of Colossians that there was a, a heresy that said that the human body was evil. All matter was evil. And so the human body was evil. And so God would never have any contact with the human body. So he developed these, these uh, spirits in order to uh, keep a distance from evil matter. But that is all blown up by the fact that Jesus comes and assumes a human body. He takes on human flesh. So their heresy is just uh, shown to be just that and falsehood. He's God in a human body, and he reconciled creation to himself. Look at it again in verse 20. Having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things. God reconciles all creation through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Now, wait a minute. Did you know that that refers not only to animate, but inanimate creation? Everything's been impacted by man's sin and Satan's rebellion. All of God's creation. And he is going to reconcile that, you know, think about it. We have weeds <laughs> that we have to always deal with. We have to deal with uh, with corruption uh, in, in just the, the natural realm. All of that is going to end one day because he is going through Christ. God will reconcile everything to himself. The only thing that won't be reconciled are those beings that have that, that are free moral agents, be they human beings or spirit beings, that refuse to bow the knee, that refuse to uh, receive or follow Christ. And as a result, they won't be reconciled, but everything else will. And thankfully, if you're a believer, you've already been reconciled. Yeah. And so that's what he's saying here. And it's all through his sacrificial death in this perfect, sinless human body, in other words, Christ is at the center of everything. That's why he's supposed to be at the center of your life. He's at the center of everything. He's the creator and sustainer of all. You know, uh, uh, a special um, Bible professor that I know of, I've, I've read probably just about every book he's written, but uh, he said he had a, a senior university student come up to him one time and said, uh, you know, I've been thinking about it. And he said, all truth proceeds from God. And uh, the professor said, yeah, that's right. That's right. He said, you know, whether it be science or math or languages or whatever, uh, eventually, if you study it uh, deep enough, you, you end up in the field of philosophy. And the professor said, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. That's why the highest degree is, uh, is the degree of a doctor of philosophy. And then the student said, but I've also thought about it, that if you study philosophy uh, deep enough, you end up in the field of theology. And he said, yeah, that's right, because philosophy, you know, doesn't have the answers. And... Uh, to life, and so you end up in the field of theology. And then he said, and theology uh, has its center, and that center is in Jesus. And that's exactly what we see here in the book of Colossians. And I hope that you are recognizing that and even experiencing that in your personal life, that Jesus is at the center of everything, and that you have submitted to him to be the center of your life. 
because that's what makes life successful. And that's what makes life satisfying. Jesus at the center of everything. So I want to finish then with the third thing. We looked at who you are in Christ, who Christ is, but finally, who you are with Christ in you. Who you are with Christ in you. In this passage, I want you to look at verse 27. Actually, back up a little bit. Uh, Paul says in verse 25 that he has made a minister or a servant according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. To fulfill what part of the word of God? Verse 26. Even the mystery. You know what a Bible mystery is? He defines it for us in that 26th verse. What is a Bible mystery? It's a truth. It's a, 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 a God-given truth that has been previously hidden for hundreds of years and generations that God determined in eternity past to reveal at a particular time. And that's what Paul said. Here is a truth that has been hidden from the beginning, from eternity, that now God has designed for me to reveal to you. Are you ready for it? What is this, Miss? What is this truth that was previously hidden? Well, it's a tremendous truth that uh, is to forever impact the lives of God's people, be they Jew or Gentile. And it really isn't an explanation as well as a fulfillment of the promise of Pentecost, which is the promise of, of the Father, which Jesus spoke about just before his departure. And he said to his disciples, I'm going to go away. But don't worry, I'm not going to leave you like orphans. I'm not going to leave you fatherless. I'm going to come to you in the person of the comforter. And that name comforter means one that is specially called alongside of another to help. I'm going to send the comforter and he is not just going to be alongside of you or with you like I have been these three and a half years of ministry. He's going to be in you. And so Christ in you is the fulfillment of the and an explanation of the promise of Pentecost. It's a revelation that has been that has been fulfilled, a wonderful, tremendous revelation from God that is fulfilled at Pentecost in the descent of God the Holy Spirit coming down to permanently indwell the body of Christ, the church, believers. Christ in you. It's revelation here. It's revealed truth that we'd have no idea about if God didn't tell us. But that revelation becomes provision, wonderful provision for us. That Messiah Jesus, who lived in a perfect, sinless human body on this earth for 33 years, now lives in your human body. And he does so via the Holy Spirit of God inhabiting your spirit. That the Holy Spirit and your human spirit are joined and united as one in Christ. That makes a major difference in a person's life. It's the most astounding truth and really is the answer to all evil or sin that you ever have to face in your human body on this earth. That Messiah Jesus is in you, so he's your conqueror. And uh, you can depend upon him for victory over any and all sin. Christ is in you. He infuses his life with its conquering, uh, victorious power over all sin that you are up against. 
and he transforms you by his power that just runs in and through your life, making it possible for you to have the ability to live up to saints, making it possible for you to live a godly life, making it possible for you to live a holy life, to live a life of victory over sin, to live a loving life that pleases God and accomplishes through you what he began to do in his own body physically, his own physical body 2,000 years ago. I think that's what Paul means in verse 24 when he says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you to fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, that is the church, his oneness with Christ, Paul's oneness with Christ in him, made Paul's sufferings for the sake of the church the same as the afflictions of Christ. When we suffer for the Lord's sake, we're suffering the afflictions of Christ. It's the same thing that uh, Jesus said to Saul of Tarsus when Saul was killing Christians. He said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Because of that oneness of Christ in you. It's a wonderful thing. Wonderful truth that we need to take. Let me try to illustrate it in a ridiculous way, but hopefully you'll understand it. Suppose you had a beautiful new car that was always filled up with gas, ready to take you anywhere you needed to go, but you never started it and you never drove it. Instead, when you needed to go somewhere, you went out to the car, you put it in neutral, and you pushed it wherever you wanted to go. That wouldn't make any sense now, would it? And yet spiritually, that's what many Christians are doing. They're born of God. They've been given a beautiful new life that has Christ in it to empower them to live it, but they're trying to push their way forward through life by self-effort instead of relying on Christ in them to live his life through them. Does that make sense to you? Let me share with you in closing a poem from the little book, The Indwelling Life of Christ by Major Ian Thomas. It's a wonderful little book. It's got 50 uh, short uh, chapters that you can read one a day. This is called Discovering Christ in Me. I'm assuming that he wrote it, but there is no uh, reference as to who the author of this poem is. Discovering daily who God really is, thanking him daily, he's mine and I'm his. Discovering daily God's great love for me, such mercy, forgiveness, and amazingly free. Discovering daily that God really cares, discovering daily he does answer prayers, discovering daily what grace really means, unmerited favor beyond all my dreams. Discovering daily God speaking to me. He speaks through the Bible. Once blind, now I see. Discovering, discovering each day that I live that all that I need, he freely will give. Discovering daily Christ working through me, accomplishing daily what never could be. Discovering daily I can't, but he can. Thanking him daily for my place in his plan. Discovering daily how real life can be when I'm living in Christ and he's living in me. Discovering daily a song in my heart with anticipation for each day to start. Delighting and basking in love so divine, secure in the knowledge I'm his and he's mine. Besides mere contentment, excitement I see, a daily adventure, Christ living in me.